The Mystery Playhouse. A rebroadcast for the service men and women of the United Nations. Good evening. This is Peter Lorre. <laughs> Would it bore you to hear a tale of tragic murder? Are you unwilling to sit through the telling of a strange and horrible story? The brief narrative of a man caught in a web of evil? You are not? <laughs> then, my friends, keep right on listening to the Mystery Playhouse. <laughs> Humor, I've heard it said many times, is of real benefit to him who possesses one. This particular sense has come to be so generally admired that it has attained the stature of a first-class virtue. Well, the fellow whom you are about to meet, while while hardly falling into the virtuous category, he does have a sense of humor. <laughs> Things like murder, or hate, and madness. Or, or someone telling him his mother just died. <laughs> Practically rolls him in the aisles. He loves a good, ghoulish joke. Oh, and he loves to tell him, too. He's about to start one now. So follow me, please, to the inner sanctum and your host, Raymond. <laughs> Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Now, come in, won't you? This is your host, Raymond, again, disturbing the peace. Say, have you ever, ever had the screaming memes? Did you ever get an attack of the yelling and wailing jitters? You walk in your sleep? Do you ever wake in the middle of the night shrieking at the top of your lungs? Oh, you do? Well, you must be an awfully hard person to live with. Friends, it's time for our story to begin. From this point on, forget everything pleasant. Get a finger ready to chew on, turn the lights down low, and listen to Peter Lorre tell you the blood-curdling tale, Death is a Joker. Come with me to the criminal court building. A tense hush falls upon the spectators as Charles Luther takes the stand. Gentlemen of the jury... I'm accused of murder. I'm an actor. A comedian. Look at my face. Ugly, huh? Yes, yeah, so ugly that whoever looks at it laughs. I'm not telling you this to win sympathy for myself. I, I tell you this because it is important to your understanding. The strange events that brought me to this courtroom today to plead for my life. Shortly before midnight of November 28th, I went to the apartment of my friend Robert Langwell, the famous actor in Matthew Yard. Charles, well, this is a surprise. Come in, come in. Thank you. Would you like a drink? No, don't bother. I don't want anything. No? Well, here, may I take your thing? Oh, oh excuse me. Hello. Oh, George. Yes, I have the money for you. You'll be up. When? Twenty minutes? Yes. Goodbye. George Galvin. You know him, Charles? Yes. Rotten actor. But an excellent poker player. So I have heard. Mm. Robert. Robert, before leaving the theater tonight, someone told me that you and Julie Winthrop are going to be married. Is it true? Yes, we'll be married in two weeks, right after my wife gets a decree in Reno. You must not marry Julie. Not marry Julie? Well, who are you to tell me what I can do? I know Julie well, and I, I also know you. 
That's why you must not marry her. Charles, it might be better for you to mind your own business. Julie and I are in love with each other. No, you are not. She's fascinated by your good looks. She, she's impressed by your fame, but she, she does not love you. Now, look here. We may be old friends, but I've stood all I'm going to. I... Oh, wait a moment. I get it now. You're in love with her yourself. I? I in love with Julie? No, we, we are just friends. Friends? <laughs> You're madly in love with her. That's why you came here tonight, isn't it? No. <laughs> friends. Stop your laughing. You, in love with a girl like Julie. Why should my love make you laugh? Oh, so you admit it, huh? All right, I do. Why is it so funny? Do you think she'd have you? You, a, a clown, ugly, clumsy? You, in love with Julie? And why not? Why not? You! Stop your laughing. Stop it. Can I? Look at yourself. Charles, uh, yeah. let go of me. No. You're choking. Let go. A joke, huh? Charles. A joke. Laugh. Go ahead. Laugh now. Laugh. Robert. Robert. I didn't mean it. Robert. Lord, what have I done? I rushed out of his apartment, trembling. I turned my coat color up to hide my face. The streets were crowded with people coming from the late movies and restaurants. I tried to make myself act naturally, but it was impossible. Everyone I saw, every pair of eyes that looked at me seemed to accuse me of my crime. I stopped, waited for the light to change. Paper, mister. Morning paper. Read about the Reynolds execution. Here, let me have one. There you are. Uh, I didn't know Reynolds was to be executed tonight. They burned him. Well, he deserved it. Murdering his friend like he did. Oh, wait a minute, mister. You forgot your chain. Never mind, never mind. and I looked at the newspaper I'd bought. There was a photograph of Reynolds on the first page. In his face, I saw my future. The shattered hopes. The torture of the trial. The horrible, nerve-wracking experience of waiting for death. I flung the paper away. I went to the window. I opened it. I looked down 17 stores to the ground. <laughs> How tiny people look. The automobile lights move like so many fireflies. I climb out on the edge. I braced my arms. I took a deep breath. One last look. I closed my eyes and... I hesitated a moment. I decided to answer it. I closed the window, went to the door. Hello, Charles. Julie. Why did you rush away from the theater tonight? I was anxious to talk to you. Talk to me about, about what? I, I need your advice, Charles. What's wrong? Well, it's Robert. What happened? Well, nothing happened. It, it's just that I'm not sure I love him. I'm not sure? Yes, when I'm with him, everything seems all right. He's mm. handsome and charming, but when I'm alone, I begin to wonder and to doubt. Why? Can't you guess why? Yes. You, you love someone else? Yes. Well, who is it? You. Me? Yes, that's what I came here to tell you. That's why I don't want to marry him. Mm. Yes, I would have told you before, but I was so afraid of making a fool of myself. Mm. You didn't seem to care. I didn't care. Julie, this is crazy. I loved you from the moment I saw you. You loved me? 
Yes. But, darling, why didn't you tell me? I'll tell you. How could I? You, you're so young. So, you're so beautiful. And I look at me. Ugly, clumsy. How could I speak to you? Oh, the boat were. How you lock me means nothing to me. Nothing? Of course not, darling. How lucky we are we found out in time. In time? <laughs> in time? Oh, merciful heavens. What a joke. <laughs> what a joke. Charles, what's wrong? Oh, what? oh, what there's tears streaming down your face. <laughs> Charles, you're hysterical. Now stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Julia. Something you must know. Yes, sir. Tonight I committed a murder. Murder? What are you talking about? I killed Robert. Killed Robert? Oh, out of your mind. You don't know what you're saying. But is it true? I went to his apartment and we quarreled and I killed him. Oh, no. You told me a moment ago that you loved me. Do you still love me? Yes, Charles. And, and tell me what to do, Julie. Help me. I, I, I can't think. I, I don't know where to turn, but... What can I do, Julie? What can I do? <laughs> yourself together, Charles. This may not be as hopeless as you think. Why? Was Robert alone in the apartment when you called? Yes. Were you seen entering or leaving? No. Are you sure? Yes, his apartment is on the second floor. I, I walked up and down. What time did you get there? Shortly before midnight. And what did you do before that? Went to a movie. Movie? How long did you stay there? Oh, only about 20 minutes. Do you have the ticket stuff? Huh? Yes, here it is. Charles, do you realize what this means? They, they may never find out about you. Never find out? That's right. They won't suspect you since they can't know your motive. No one saw you enter or leave, and you have an excellent alibi. Motive? Oh, Brad, Julie, do you realize what we are doing? We are talking of this as, as if we planned this crime as, as though we were criminals. But I committed a crime, yes, but I'm no criminal. I... I didn't mean to do it. I know, darling, I know. You can think of your own life now. Oh, and mine. Yeah. Yes, Julia. Oh, I see what you mean. I'm not a criminal, but I must play the role of a criminal now. A subtler, clever criminal who is cunning enough to escape punishment. Can I do it? Can I do it, Julia? Charles, listen to me. We must find out how much the police know. Mm-hmm. If it's hopeless and they have found out about you, then it would be best to give yourself up. But let's not make any decisions until we know. But how can we know? Did Robert expect anyone tonight? Yes, George Galvin phoned when I was there. He said he'd be up in about 20 minutes. Then the body must have been discovered by now. Yes, I'm, I'm sure the police must be there by this time. I think that I'll go to Robert's apartment. No, Julie, no, no. I, I don't want you to become involved. I'm already involved. Once for me, this horrible thing would never have happened. The least I can do is to help you now. But, Julia... Promise, promise me you'll not leave this apartment, Charles. All right. I won't be long. Julia. Yes. If if something happens, if if something goes wrong and is separated before you return, I I want you to know that I don't know what to say, Julia. You don't have to say it, darling. I know what you mean. Goodbye. Goodbye. I have to think like one, to act like one, have to be one. What question would be asked? Where were you at 12 o'clock midnight of November 28th? Uh, I was in a movie and here's the stop. Oh, no. Oh, no, they, they can see immediately that I'm lying. My voice must not tremble. I... I shouldn't be so quick with the answer. Where were you at 12 midnight of November 28th? Where was I? Let me see. Well, I... I left the theater and I went to a movie. It was a very amusing picture. (laughs) Very amusing. Can you prove...
prove what you say. Prove? Well, I don't know. I, it would be difficult, I. Well, I may have to take it stuff somewhere. Yes, here. <laughs> Let me show it to you. Here it is. Did you ever quarrel with Robert Langwell? Quarrel oh, with... We were friends. We played in many shows together. We were on the best of terms. That's all, Mr. Luther. You may leave now. Yes. I can plead. It is possible. I can escape punishment. Police. Can it be the police? Or maybe it is Julie. Good evening, Charles. George Gill. I know it's rather late for an unexpected visit. Yes, it is. But this is important, Charles. A matter of uh, life and death, you might say. What do you mean? Have you a cigarette? Hmm? Yes, here. Thanks. Well, what's the matter, Charles? Your hand's trembling. <laughs> it's nothing. You don't seem to be your usual self this evening. No quips, no jokes. What's wrong? I don't always feel like joking. Yes, Charles, it's strange about human nature, isn't it? Who would have ever dreamed that tonight, a few minutes before midnight, you entered Robert Langwell's apartment, quarreled with him over Julie, and choked him to death? What are you talking about? Uh, you're an excellent actor, Charles. But you're wasting your talents on me. Save them for the footlights. Or the police. Police? Will you please tell me what all this is about? Still acting, huh? Now look, Charles. You killed Robert shortly before midnight tonight. You are mistaken. I was in a movie at that time. Oh, so that's your alibi. Very clever. No, Charles. Either we discuss terms now or I go to the police. Wait. How did you find out? That is my secret. What do you want? Money. All you have on hand. All you can dig up. All right. Come with me. I I have some money in the bedroom. All right. Uh, just a moment. What is the business? Yeah. What is... Why? I'm taking no chances. Let's go. All right. Well? Where's the money? Charles, stand back or I'll fire. Stand back. No! Let go of my hand. Let go. I'll twist it. I'll I'll twist it till the gun points to your head. There. There. Charles, let go of my hand. You don't know what you're doing. Come on, come on. Fire now. The bullet will enter your brain. Fire. Charles. Fire. Charles, don't. I'll make you fire. I'll squeeze your fingers. Charles, let go. Go on. This is all a joke. I'll make you. Stop it. Charles. Charles. Uh. Uh. Just a second. Just a second. Charles. Darling. Darling, there's nothing more to worry about. Everything's all right now. We can be married and go on living and never fear anything. What makes you say that? Darling, you didn't commit a crime at all. What do you mean? Robert's alive. Alive? Yes, he's downstairs now paying the taxi. Robert? He's alive? Yes. I spoke to him about the marriage and he was wonderful about the whole thing. Darling, aren't you happy? Her worries are all over. You can smile and be gay. That must be Robert now. Hello, child. Robert. I thought you were... Well, I'm not. But, but how did you... You see, I fainted. George Galvin came in and brought me to. George Galvin. Did you tell George Galvin what happened? Yes, I did. Look here, Charles. As I told Julie, I'm willing to forget the whole thing if you are. Forget? Forget? Yeah. It might have ended tragically, you know, but... Thinking it over, I realize I'm as much to blame as you are. So if you're willing to shake hands. Shake hands? Dear, now, darling, there's nothing more to worry about. <laughs> I feel so happy I could... Charles, what's the matter with you? It's... It's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing. <laughs> it's nothing. <laughs> Gentlemen of 
left the jury. I became a criminal. Well, because I thought I had committed a crime and I had to think like a criminal. <laughs> My motives were those of all men. I wanted happiness and wanted marriage to the woman I loved. What would you have done in my place? And I still think I know that guy. Huh. I wish I could place him. Well, it must be wonderful to have a sense of humor, but I don't think Charlie feels much like laughing. Do you? We'll pay a return visit to the inner sanctum and its fun-loving host, Raymond, soon, but don't go, please. Not until we drop in at the green room, where the players are rehearsing our next performance in the mystery playhouse. Come with me, please. Come, come. <laughs> Change the dressings at midnight, and again in the morning, nurse. Yes, doctor. Well, doctor, what did you find? Will I be blind? Is it very bad? Now, now, take it easy, Mr. Denton. There's nothing to worry about. Nothing at all. You... You're sure? You aren't just saying that. I'm quite sure. Valerie! Valerie, did you hear that? I... I'm not going to be blind. Valerie? Valerie, where are you? Right here, darling. Did you hear... I won't be blind. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, darling, it's marvelous. You... You don't sound very excited. Valerie, don't you realize I'm going to see again? She doesn't sound excited because I don't want you to be excited, Mr. Denton. You've got to relax. Try to sleep. Sleep? With this ungodly pain? My eyes feel as though they were on fire. That will stop the as soon as the opiate I gave you takes hold, you'll be comfortable, I'm sure. Now, good night. You're going now, Doctor? Yes, I'll... I'll look in on... on your husband in the morning. Stephen. Yes, Valerie? Do you mind if I step out into the corridor for a moment? But you... you promise not to leave me. I, I'm afraid, Valerie. Everything's so dark, I... The nurse will be here, dear, if you want anything... I just want to ask Dr. Wade some questions. Questions? But he's already told us... To yes, me. Stephen, I know. But I'd like to find out about the treatment and how I'm to take care of you when we get you home, you know. Just little things. All right. But, but hurry back. I, I want you near me. I will, dear. So good night, Mr. Denton. Good night, Doctor. And thank you. You're quite welcome. After you, Mrs. Denton. Thank you. I suggest we step into the consultation room across the hall. We'll have more privacy. All right. Here we are. Thank you. Well, it's been a long time, Valerie. Yes, Paul, it has. Almost ten years, isn't it? About that. Strange that you should have called me, of all people, to treat your husband's eyes. Oh, I, I was panicky, Paul. I didn't know what to do. It all happened so suddenly. Stephen was working in his laboratory at the house when suddenly I heard a violent explosion. I ran in and found him clutching his eyes and screaming, I'm blind. First thing I thought of was an ambulance. Then you... Why didn't you think of me ten years ago? It's not fair, Paul. Was it fair to turn your back on me and then to marry a man almost twice your age? Paul, please, why bring up ancient history? It isn't ancient history to me. I've never forgotten you. Paul, about Stephen's eyes. What about them? I have a feeling that you weren't telling him the truth. You're right. Oh, you mean he's not going to regain his sight? He's going to be blind? Oh, Paul. You don't expect me to be to be terribly concerned, do you, Valerie? 
After all, he did take you away from me. Don't be vindictive, Paul. It wasn't Stephen's fault. He didn't even know of your existence. And you never told him that we were on the point of being married? No, never. <laughs> it's rather ironic that we should meet again at the bedside of my rival. Your husband. A man who may forever walk in darkness. Don't say that, Paul. It's horrible. But unfortunately true. A moment ago, you told me not to be vindictive. I'm not, really. But if I were, I could have my fill of vengeance if I told him about us. And then told him that he'll be blind forever. You wouldn't, Paul. Or I might take another form of revenge. I could tell you that an operation is called for. A very delicate operation. Are you trying to say that there might be a chance? Yes. But supposing I refuse to perform the operation? Paul, you're joking. You can't mean that. Perhaps not. But you call me vindictive. Suppose I operate and my scalpel slips. What if he dies? That would be murder. You're not a murderer, Paul. You wouldn't risk your professional reputation. Why must you torment me this way? You really love him, don't you? Yes, I do. Then forget the things that I've been saying. I want you to think of me as a friend. I want you to trust me. I do trust you, Paul. Thank you. Now as to the possibility of surgery. Here is the situation. The transparent film over your husband's eyes, the corneas, were burned and torn with the explosion. They've been so damaged that blindness will result, even though the eyes heal. But you think an operation would cure that? Possibly, although it's a very delicate job. The injured cornea must be peeled away and replaced by a fresh, healthy one. Where can you get healthy corneas? From the eyes of the dead. Oh. It isn't quite as horrible as it sounds, Valerie. You know, dying peace, people often will their eyes for just this purpose. We maintain what we call a corneal bank. It's much the same as a blood bank, only but there's this difference. Corneal tissue can't be stored more than 48 hours. It must be fresh, or it's no good. You have some available in the bank? No, that's the trouble. I'm afraid we haven't. But there's got to be some, Paul. I don't know where, Valerie... Unless... Unless what? I was just thinking. Last night, one of the interns asked me to look at a charity case that puzzled him. The patient is a Hindu or a Persian named Chandra. He lives in a dirty little shack near the waterfront. Yes, Paul? I stopped by and examined him. I found an incurable condition. There's no way to save him. He won't live more than a day or two. But his eyes are healthy. You mean... You think he might... I don't know. You'd have to have his consent, of course. Take me to him, Paul. I'm sure I can make him understand. Oh, it may not be so easy, Valerie. He's a strange person. A mystic and a spiritualist. Let me try. Just take me to him. All right. We can go there now. Doctor, sound familiar to you? Huh? <laughs> That's right. It's Boris Karloff, up to his old tricks. I think it might amuse you to be on hand for our next performance when we present Mr. Karloff and Creeps by Night. This is Peter Lorre closing the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. Good night. Sleep tight. The 
This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. <laughs>